Welcome to Lecture 9, the final lecture in the section on viscoelasticity. The story that we've developed up until this point has involved the derivation of a mechanical model, the Maxwell model. When we initially derived this model, it suffered from three fairly major flaws. It couldn't describe the phenomenon of shear thinning in steady shear. It didn't have enough flexibility to fit the response of real materials. And because of the way we derived it, because the reference frame in which we examined the Maxwell element, it wasn't capable of modelling flow situations. Now, throughout the past few lectures, we've addressed these limitations. We've addressed the problem of fitting real data. We introduced the multi-mode Maxwell equation, and we saw that it could fit linear viscoelastic data, G prime, G double prime, eta star, very, very well. We then addressed the problem of nonlinearity, the ability of the Maxwell model to fit the phenomenon of shear thinning in steady shear. And to do this, we introduced a new piece of strain dependent physics, the Wagner damping function. When inserted within an integral formulation of Maxwell, an integral formulation with respect to past strain, we saw that we were able to model shear thinning in steady shear. We also introduced a rule of thumb that addressed the problem about modelling flows and the frame of reference problem. The rule of thumb was that if the polymer relaxes far more quickly than the deformation rate deforms it, then you know what an Eulerian frame of reference will kind of do. And we can use the simple versions of differential or integral Maxwell to model certain restricted flow scenarios. We call these flow scenarios small displacement gradients. Um, but what we're going to do this lecture is look at how to formally address flows, how we can develop a version of the Maxwell model that can model any arbitrary flow subject to a few caveats. We're going to introduce a new frame of reference, something called convected coordinates, and we're going to convert differential Maxwell into these convected coordinates and come up with something called upper convected Maxwell. We're then going to see how upper convected Maxwell responds to our by now familiar deformations such as steady shear and stress relaxation after steady shear. And we're going to see that we're going to take a step back and a step forward, but more on which steps are back and which steps are forward in a minute. So let's introduce the concept of a convected coordinate system and do so by putting it in the frame of a standard Cartesian coordinate system. I'm going to talk about a deformation. So here on the board, I'm going to put a sketch up of what a capillary stretch looks like. So we've got a piece of polymer between two plates, and we're going to pull the plates apart, much as we would for a capillary breakup experiment. And we'll see a filament form. And the filament forms over time, T1, T2, T3. And you go from sort of a donut of material to an elongated fluid bridge. Now, let's imagine this deformation with a coordinate system superposed on top of it. The aim of the exercise is to track an individual Maxwell element. All right, in reality, of course, what we're looking at is the fluid region where a certain group of polymer chains exist. But thinking of tracking a Maxwell element is quite a useful mental picture. I've put in brown a grid that is my Cartesian coordinate system. The green circle is the origin of this Cartesian coordinate system. And the red dot is the Maxwell element that I want to track. And I'm going to deform this Maxwell element. And the object of the exercise is to be able to keep track of its location so I can accurately calculate its stress history. So let's pull those two plates apart. Let's deform the fluid and see where this blob, this red blob, this Maxwell element moves to. In brackets below the diagram, I've put the xy coordinates of that red fluid blob. So I pull the plates apart, my fluid bridge forms, and broadly speaking, my red blob, my Maxwell element that I'm interested in, stays largely where it is, close to the top plate. But in terms of the coordinate system that I'm using, it's changed position quite radically. It's gone from a position near x equals 6, y equals 4, through to x equals roughly 3.5, y equals 6. Now, 
this is a problem if what we want to do is laser in on that Maxwell element and keep track of all the deformations that it's been subjected to. If we've got a Lagrangian frame of reference where we can in effect sit in the fluid as it deforms and watch the Maxwell element all well and good. However, in this very much Eulerian reference frame, we can't do that unless we have a means of somehow tracking the motion in addition to the position. So this is the problem with flow scenarios, how we keep track of a stress history accurately. Now the concept we're going to look at now is one where the coordinate system deforms with the flow. This is the concept of convected coordinates. And I remember discussing this with a colleague who's now retired, and he says, good grief, the last time I saw convected coordinates was in cosmology, where you can use it to describe warping of space-time. So here you go, rheology is rocket science after all. So, with my convected coordinate system, I have now squeezed my coordinate system into the fluid. It's still orthogonal, so each of the intersections at right angles to one another. I've arbitrarily placed my origin now in the middle of the coordinate system, and my red blob still corresponds to the Maxwell element or the group of Maxwell elements that I wish to track. And they start off at coordinates 3, 1. Now, I'm going to deform my fluid again, I'm going to pull those pistons apart, and in doing so my coordinate system deforms as well. And look, in terms of the convected coordinate system, the position I'm interested in stays the same. And so here is a way how to track the stress history of an element by using a change of coordinate system. There's a couple of assumptions this implies. It implies, implies that the fluid is continuous. So we're not in the Knudsen regime where, for example, you've got very, very, very few molecules in a large space, a rarefied, um, rarefied fluid. Polymeric fluids are, I struggle to think how they would become rarefied. This also means that you've got no turbulence, no fracture. You've got a smooth change of system. So the nearest neighbours of the fluid always sort of remain together, even if the nearest neighbours may move and deform. So let's see mathematically what this means. On the blackboard now, I've put up the partial time derivative of a stress tensor. If you think about the differential Maxwell model, we had the partial time derivative of a stress, not a tensorial quantity, a scalar quantity, because we were looking at just the stress in a Maxwell element. But there's no reason why we couldn't have derived a similar model with a partial time derivative of a stress tensor. This is in a fixed coordinate system. If we're to translate this to my convected coordinate system, I simply do a substitution. Now, the notation I'm using here is that wherever you have a subscript brackets 1, that is the order of derivative, convected derivative, that we're talking about. So, tau, subscript brackets 1, is my first upper convected time derivative of, in this case, tau, stress tensor. Now, we're not going to go through the derivation of where the expression on the right-hand side comes from. If you're interested in learning where it comes from, I can highly recommend the excellent book by Bird, Armstrong and Hassiger, Dynamics of Polymeric Liquids, Volume 1. Have a read through one of the appendices of that book and it will give you all the continuum mechanics concepts that lead to that formulation for this upper convected time derivative. We will take that result as established in this course. If we examine this result, we can see that there are three terms principally. There is a total derivative, big D by dt, of a quantity, the quantity being tau in this case. And in orange on the board, as a reminder, the total derivative of a parameter x, be it scalar, vector, or tensor, is the partial time derivative of that parameter, plus the dot product of the velocity field and the gradient of that parameter. Now, in the case of tau, stress tensor, that second term, v dot grad tau, in the total derivative, involves a dot product of a vector field, my velocity, and grad tau. It's a third rank tensor. Okay, So tau is a second rank tensor. We're taking the gradient of it. It evolves to a third rank tensor. 
the dot product of a vector and a third rank tensor leads back to a second rank tensor. So remember in lecture one, we had this concept of rank homogeneity when we're adding quantities together. You can't add tensors to vectors to scalars. So this is obeying that. So you've got rank one tensor, a vector, dot product rank three tensor, giving rank two tensor. Now, another property of this upper convected time derivative is symmetry. Remember, right back in lecture one, we examined the symmetry of the stress tensor, and we said that for our purposes, it's always going to be symmetric. So that anything that gives rise to the calculation of a stress tensor has to preserve symmetry. That total derivative, big D by dt of tau, preserves stress tensorial symmetry because it's just a partial time derivative of something symmetric. And if you think about it, that dot product term, v dot grad tau, will also be symmetric because the grad tau is just going to be the gradient of a symmetric quantity. So the dot product of that with a vector will give a symmetric quantity. If you look at the second and third term in the curly brackets on the board, you'll see actually they should be treated as one because we've got grad v transpose dot tau, second rank third rank tensor, sorry, second rank tensor dot product second rank tensor plus tau dot grad v second rank tensor dot product second rank tensor. Okay, that is a symmetric entity. If you think about how we defined strain rate gamma dot, it was grad v plus grad v transpose and it was a sum of grad v and its transpose that gave us symmetry. Here we have exactly the same idea. So the upper convected time derivative of stress, tau subscript brackets 1, is symmetric and is second rank tensor. OK, let's see what else we do. Another substitution we can make is for strain rate or for strain. Now, imagine for an instant, if you will, that we have the nth partial derivative of strain rate with respect to time. Now, we know that the derivative of strain rate with respect to time is simply the next higher order derivative of strain. So the nth partial derivative of strain rate will be the n plus oneth derivative of strain. OK, and the derivative of strain when written in upper convected coordinates is there written on the board. And it's very, very similar in form to that for the stress tensor. Now, if we have the first upper convected derivative of strain, it's simply gamma dot, our rate of strain tensor, second rank tensor. So, again, we're not going to go through the derivations of where these upper convected time derivatives come from. Bird Armstrong and Hasseker does that very, very elegantly for you, should you wish to have a look. What we're going to do is we're going to see how we use these entities. So here on the board now, I've put a reminder of our very simple differential Maxwell element. This is a linear viscoelastic model. It doesn't describe shear thinning in steady shear, and it can't fit real data because there's only one mode. We can deal with those problems, as you've seen. But let's see how we convert it into upper convected form. So on the left hand side, eta gamma dot simply becomes eta gamma dot tensor. On the right hand side, the term we need to look at is that lambda d by dt of tau. That converts to the upper convected time derivative of stress, tau brackets 1. So converting a simple constitutive equation written in differential form to an upper convected differential equation is actually just a case of substituting in these results for the upper convected derivatives. That's all there is to it. So there is a simplification we can use because if you think about the first upper convected time derivative of the stress tensor, it involves the total derivative, big D by big DT of tau, in which there is that V dot grad tau term. And that grad tau term we said was third rank. Now we don't really want to have to deal with third rank tensors unless we really have to. What we'd ideally like to do is set that to zero so we don't have to worry about that third rank tensor. Now there is a flow simplification that allows us to make that statement and we call it flow homogeneity. Again, we're not going to prove this, but it can be shown 
that if your shear rate in a flow is independent of position, then v dot grad tau equals zero. We call this an homogeneous flow. And all the flow scenarios we're going to look at for this course will be homogeneous. So v dot grad tau equals zero for an homogeneous flow. OK, let's summarize some key points. What we've done is to introduce a new coordinate system. It's a convected coordinate system, one that deforms with the flow. Using this concept, we can track very readily the stress history of a single element of a constitutive model. And so we can accurately describe what the deformation history has been, hence what its current state of stress is now. The way in which we derive an upper convected model is simply by substitution of the upper convected derivatives. So partial d tau by dt becomes tau subscript brackets 1, gamma dot scalar becomes gamma dot tensor, and the nth time derivative of gamma dot become the n plus 1th upper convected time derivative of strain for which we've seen a definition. We've got this important simplification that we will always use for our purposes, which allows us to simplify what the upper convected stress derivative is, because an homogeneous flow has v dot grad t equal to zero.